This is an interesting case of a nuclear cataract in a 12-year-old girl. Uh, she presented with decreased vision and amblyopia in both eyes. As you can see at the beginning of the case here, we're making a small secondary incision to allow us to inject uh, air and some tripan blue for capsular staining. And this is being used because the capsular excess is going to be right over the area of the nuclear cataract and frequently that shadowing leads to difficulty with seeing your excess as they are almost equivalent. Uh, so some capsular staining has been done and irrigated from the anterior chamber. Uh, now the primary surgical wound uh, is being created with the keratome and you can see it's being done clear corneal just anterior to the limbal blood vessels and then uh, using a highly cohesive viscoelastic to keep that anterior capsule flat and a bent tip needle cystotome to initiate our capsular excess uh, which will then uh, tear 360 degrees. You know, this girl is 12 years old so it's not quite as challenging as uh, infant cataract but it still behaves differently than an adult anterior capsule and you can see that while uh, to some degree it's being led around tangentially uh, like you do with an adult, um, you do have to be careful with pulling towards the middle a little bit more than you would normally with an adult. And again, to my point earlier of wanting to stain the capsule, you can see how that uh, capsulotomy is almost identical to the nuclear opacity size. So the capsular staining is helpful in these cases. Uh, once we've got our anterior capsule uh, completed, uh, since there are no posterior capsule abnormalities in this case we're performing some uh, hydrodissection. Uh, the cortex in younger children is uh, extremely adherent to the capsule and it's always helpful to have that liberated in multiple quadrants so that you can facilitate the cortical cleanup. Subincisional cortex is particularly difficult in children uh, given the adherence of the uh, material. And here you can see a suture is being placed over the incision because uh, we're using a vitrectomy handpiece and an infusion cannula in this case. And if you do that through uh, a larger 2.5 millimeter incision, which was utilized for the capsulotomy, um, you'll have too much leakage around the vitrectomy handpiece. So you'll want to close that incision down slightly. Alternatively, uh, if you have access to a small incision capsular excess forcep, you can do this through a simple MVR blade width incision and not have to place the suture in. I think that's uh, ideal if that instrument is available to you. Uh, the vitrectomy handpiece you see is mostly being used with the port facing upward. Um, the cortical material is relatively dense, so it does tend to follow itself out. And here's the advantage of uh, having two ports, is you can use a kind of a bimanual technique, just simply switching the anterior chamber maintainer and the vitrectomy handpiece to reach that very difficult subincisional cortex, uh, which is quite easy when you simply go to a port which is 90 degrees or more opposite of your primary incision. And our last little bit of cortex has come out there. Uh, during the um, injection of this one-piece lens, you can see the plungers out a little bit further perhaps than normal. And once the lens is in the eye, it's visible that there's a crack in the lens implant off to the right-hand side there. Now, fortunately, it's peripheral, but uh, uh, there's some other striation cracks uh, extending in towards the middle. And the decision is made in this particular case to explant the IOL and simply replace it. And I think this is a good illustration of uh, how it's most easily done. Uh, grasping that haptic and cutting directly underneath the haptic that is in your forcep while it's outside the wound. Um, these are simple Vanna's scissors and trying to cut across the mid portion of the lens extending from behind one haptic 
to behind the opposite haptic. And that'll give you two roughly equivalent halves, each with a haptic as a handle to guide them out of the uh, incision. If you don't cut underneath the haptic, you have a hard time removing those fragments. And here you can see that the halves are a little bit unequal, so the wound's being enlarged slightly to allow a less traumatic explantation of this larger jagged piece. You don't want to be dragging this across the endothelium of the cornea. So here you can see that the surgeon is doing a nice job of wheeling that out of there. There's also a technique of uh, only cutting partially across the IOL and then cartwheeling the two halves out while they remain attached. And you just have to be careful not to uh, contact the endothelium when you do that. Once those two fragments are removed, then you can place more viscoelastic in the eye and go back to a repeat injection. And here you can see that the plunger did not extend onto the surface of the optic like it did with the first implantation. And now that uh, pristine intraocular lens can be easily dialed into position. I think that's one of the real benefits of uh, this particular lens, particularly for pediatric cataracts, is that it tends to open quite slowly and allows you to maneuver it into position, particularly if you have a, an irregular capsulotomy. And here you can see this one's a little on the small side, even though it's perfectly round. Uh, but having this slowly opening lens allows you to maneuver into position uh, when the capsulotomy is small, when the capsulotomy is irregular and there's a risk of extensions, or even if you have an opening in your posterior capsule. Uh, so this particular Alcon lens, uh, I think, is really ideal for these circumstances. And uh, at least in the U.S., this is the lens of choice for pediatric cataract surgery. Once that's in place, we've put a suture across the corneal incision to kind of tighten it up again. And now using the vitrector to remove the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. And now placing some subconjunctival antibiotics and uh, steroids. Uh, this step is optional. Uh, but maybe preferable if, uh, if there's any chance that follow-up could be uh, poor uh, with your patient.